Okay, seeing none. Well, thank you so much in, uh, for joining us, Victoria. And again, I want to welcome everyone to General Council of July 13th. Uh, we have just done our identification of media as well as our opening address from Amber Squire. So Nyawa to Amber for that. I will look to number three on our agenda, which is any changes or deletions or uh, additions to the agenda. Thank you, Councilor Michelle. Yep, I have a few. Few. Okay, um, do you want to give the topics? Okay, update on internet towers. Um, uh, more of a reminder on the Indian Day School because um, I've received a couple complaints of companies asking to uh, do some work for, for individuals. The dumping issue, Seneca and Third Line, um, as well as um, sports events. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Uh, are there any any further additional items? Uh, I have one. Mark, it's Hazel. Okay, I see Helen, and I'll move over to Hazel. Uh, yeah, I just wanted an update on the um, uh, the Woodland Cultural Center's search. Okay, thank you for that, Helen. Hazel. Yeah, I just wanted to. Um, ask about the internet towers for uh, when are they going to be active, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, thank you for that, Hazel. Michelle also has that as one of her updates. So we'll look to our SEO uh, an update there. Uh, Councillor Wendy. Hi, thank you, Mark. And, and a couple of things. One, I wanted to add uh, Gawaneo. At the last session, I missed the open and brought an item up in camera, and I had uh, agreed with council that I would bring it up and make it public. So I'll, I'll do that tonight. Um, second item, I'm just wondering, um, items two, four, and five in camera, why are they in camera and can they be open? Sorry, my apologies, I'm from you. Uh, I believe those items still have some confidential aspects to that, which is why they're still left in camera. Again, any decisions that are passed, uh, we'll can it have a motion to move out of camera for next session. Is there anything further? Nathan, Councillor Nathan? Just wanted, uh, well, to, uh, I'll go to my items first. Um, just wanted to provide a quick verbal update on our environment um, strategic uh, session today. Um, and also just wanted to, to have a discussion, maybe an update on, on a community, um, community wide update, public update. Uh, and whether or not we're going to proceed with, uh, I know we talked about um, AGM. Uh, in the past, uh, but just wanted to, to kind of raise that again and, um, and see uh, timing and, and when we can um, go back to doing some public meetings um, in, in terms of uh, looking either in the next few months, the fall, just the timing of, of that particular piece. And then um, in relation to item number two from in camera, I thought we did discuss, and, and Darren brought it up, um, that uh, we would get kind of that full update on, on the response, uh, doing that in a public meeting, and then go to the decision. Uh, back to Helen's point, too, about not changing process on the fly. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if that's kind of the same approach on item number two. I'll have to uh, just check in with our SAO, uh, Darren, if he has anything that he can uh, provide in by virtue of update on that piece. Uh, thanks, Chief, and thanks everyone. Um, that item was deferred from, from finance because there was some additional um, action. I did, I have followed up with the Lens and Research Department. They are preparing a presentation to educate community on the current process for consultation and accommodation. Uh, and not specific to any one project. So that is something that's being developed that isn't developed yet. 
So I would suggest that that item needs to be again deferred um, until we have that presentation in a state of readiness. That was the agreement at the last meeting. So it was just deferred because it was there was no decision made at the last meeting. Okay, so when we get into that that portion of the agenda, we can discuss that item then. So it does sound like it will also be deferred at that time as well, Nathan. Uh, is there any further questions or comments? Chief. Uh, Michelle? So the number five and in camera, we, we've talked about that before in open. So that's, is that not a done deal? The plans came forward two years ago. So can that not be an open? The, the only dif the difficulty I'm having, and I apologize as I'm just returning back, but uh, you know, we've, we've had, I don't know how long these agendas been out. So I don't know if there's any been further discussion via email on in camera. You know, it's a dif the difficulty is we're talking about the open session right now. So, uh, you know, if there's, I, I understand the concern of bringing items forward into the open session. I just wonder why we have to do it at this forum and why this can be done prior. Helen? Yeah, uh, I'm, th I'm sitting here thinking the same thing. Why are counselors waiting? to the general council meeting to start talking about bringing things in camera, out of in camera. We've had these agendas for a few days. We could have done that before and had everything straightened out. Yeah, so that's what I suggest moving forward uh, is that you know when we get it in, again, our team, our admin team do work uh, tirelessly to get the agendas out as quickly as possible so that we can look to these uh, catches. Um, so I would suggest that we have these conversations prior to general council. So we're not going back and forth on agendas because it does take a lot of work from our admin team to put these agendas together. Wendy? Yeah, I'll, I'll just respond to the question. The reason that I brought it forward is that's been the acceptable process since I've been sitting in this 58th council is to raise that on the floor when it comes up. So um, if that's now changed and we're to do it before and not do it, then I'm fine with that and I'll abide by that. But that's the reason I brought it up. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that, Wendy. And to be on to be honest, as we look to our follow-up retreat, this is actually part of a part of the retreat in itself as well, so that we can look to uh, processes moving forward from that point on. So that being said, is there anything further to add uh, to the agenda? We have quite the agenda now. <laughs> is there anything further? Seeing or hearing none, then can I get a motion to adopt the general council of uh, council agenda of July 13th uh, with the additional items added? Moved by Councillor Audrey, seconder. I'll second. Second by Councillor Carey. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Uh, we do have a, a couple of delegations and presentations this evening. Our first delegation is uh, the Woodland Cultural Center. Uh, in relation to supporting documents of the constitution as well as the, uh, the strategic plan and the appointment of the elected official to the board of directors. So I, I do believe I see, good evening Janice, uh, the director of Woodland uh, is joining us this evening. So I will pass the floor uh, over to Woodland Cultural Center. Good evening. Sego everyone. Um, yes, so just a, I provided a briefing note with attached documentation for your information, but I will just go over the background, current status, and our um, recommended action and timeline. Uh, this Woodland Cultural Center is a leader in the revitalization of First Nations of the Eastern Woodland area, culture, language, and spirituality, and shall have as its aims and objectives the preservation, accurate documentation, education, and promotion of the values, practices, language, national treasures, treasures and articles of both the past and contemporary uh, First Nations of the Eastern Woodland area peoples. The center will provide a comfortable and comprehensive facility where community, youth, elders, students, scholars, and people of both Anishinaabe and Ongwehoe can research, reaffirm, celebrate, learn, display, and discuss their culture, language, history, art, and values. Membership in the center shall be open to any First Nation which subscribes to the aims, objectives, and purposes of the center and whose members and government actively participate in the activities and administration of the center. Uh, our current status is that uh, the building and land um, our Six Nations elected council owns, a seat for an elected official would be beneficial. According to our constitution, Article 4, Board of Directors, the overall management of the center shall be vested in a board of directors consisting of up to three members of each member First Nation, all of whom shall be appointed by and for such length of time as the councils of the member First Nation shall designate by council resolution. Appointees do not need to be counselors, 
and at least one of the appointees should be a community member with skills or experience required by the board. Just as a background to that, the other uh, supporting First Nations are uh, Wafda Mohawks and Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte, along with Six Nations of the Grand River. Our key issue is that the Woodland Cultural Center is now at a very important and crucial time in our organization. Given our capital fundraising campaign to restore the former Mohawk Institute Indian Residential School. It is important that we have a full board of directors to ensure that the fundraising and operations are being dealt with in a timely manner. The organization recently underwent a new strategic plan and has some ambition ambitious action items to achieve to ensure the success of the organization into the next five years. Our key actions are to diversify and increase funding increase awareness support lifelong learning processes, build strategic and community partnerships, and strengthen governance and operations. What I am asking of the Six Nations Elected Council is to appoint via council resolution an elected councillor to be a member of the board of directors of the Woodland Cultural Center to ensure the success and sustainability of the organization and to ensure communication is being received by the Six Nations Elected Council in a timely and informative manner on all matters concerning the Woodland Cultural Center. Nawa. Okay, okay Nawa, and thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Janice. Uh, I will look to any questions or comments for Janice. I see Helen has her hand up. I just wanted to comment. We, we used to have a counselor, sit, two counselors sitting there actually. The reason that we quit participating was because we found it was all administrative work. So as Jana said, we can appoint anybody. It doesn't have to be a counselor, but it's it's mostly administrative work and, and we're counselors. We, we shouldn't be sitting on a board that's only all administration. If there was political issues, that would be fine, but. Janice or whomever can bring the political issues to council if there's any political issues. That's one of the reasons why, and I think it was during, I don't know whether it was Ava's council or Bill's council that we quit going. I think it was Ava's because we found it all administrative. So, but if council wants to continue, that's up to you guys. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Helen. Uh, Wendy. Uh, th thanks, Janice. And I did read through your strategic plan and all the documents you have. Very well done, very thorough. In terms of moving forward, I do see that you're looking at, uh, you know, looking at governance and the structure and, and doing a review of all that going forward. So I think, I mean, that really speaks to the organization and the growth. And knowing what you're up against right now with everything that's going on with re recovering children, I mean, it's, you know, I I'm sure you need all the support that you can get there. So um, I'm certainly in favor of that's what the board is, is requesting and the work that's ongoing. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Wendy. Are there any further questions or comments for Janice? Again, we are looking to have our follow-up uh, retreat for our, even our own strategic direction, uh, Janice, in the, in the next, uh, next month. Um, so perhaps maybe this is an item where we can uh, do some more discussion uh, within council. And uh, is there a, a time frame to this? I do recognize again to Wendy's point on uh, you know the the amount of work that is that is uh, you know has been happening and is going to continue to happen over the the weeks and in and, and months and potentially years to come. So just wondering in a sense if there's any time sensitivity or or would 30 days suffice uh, to give a response. Um, well, the board of directors right now, obviously, are we're still continuing to do our work that we have to do. Um, I don't think waiting 30 days would <clears throat> be prohibitive in any sense, uh, but we are looking for that connection with um, uh, specifically as it relates, as, as you know, we're moving forward with a lot of things on our plate that typically aren't usually on our plate. Um, so we're like seeking some more guidance and partnership with elected council. And uh, we do have um, elected council representative from Wata Mohawks on our board of directors. Um, Mohawks of the Bay Quinty hasn't appointed a person yet, but uh, our goal has always been to make sure we have those lines of communication open with each First Nation. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Janice. And I do recognize as well uh, that you know we've been trying to to assist 
uh, as best as we can uh, with with the amount of work that that is being uh, now um, have have to happen right with with what's happening. So I do recognize those pieces as well. Uh, I just want to shift over. I see Councilor Nathan has his hand up. Thanks, Chief. Uh, just a question for Janice. Um, in terms of the um, future board coming or future board member coming from Six Nations Elected Council, as well as the work anticipated going forward, um, what um, what kind of uh, rep are you looking? Are you looking for that political kind of um, rep, or are you looking still um, for the administrative one? Just so that when we go back and have our strategic planning session, we can put forward um, exactly what you're looking for. Yeah, we're looking definitely for advocacy and, uh, and um, sort of that political pressure. Um, as you can imagine, we're severely underfunded and uh, the added um, tasks assigned to us has been very um, overwhelming for my team. Um, we're looking for someone to advocate not only just on behalf of the cultural center program that we, we run, but also um, we're probably looking at a national advisory uh, committee um, as we ramp up to open the residential school in 2024. So there is a lot of key huge things strategically that need to happen. Um, and it's not just on a regional level, it's going to be provincial and national and possibly international. Um, huge capital campaigns are in our future. We need people who know people um, to be allies and advocates for the center as we begin to continue to grow. Um, not just not only in the territory, but outwards. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Nathan and Janice. Just uh, so Janice, I think that's by by virtue of, of just what I'm hearing of the discussion. You know, I, I think that we could have more of a thorough discussion at our follow up retreat uh, to then look to uh, a person or member, whoever, whomever that might be to to be on the board of directors at the Woodland Culture Center. But just while we have you on the line so that 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 solves really for a one so that the I know the the issue as to why you're here, but there's a couple other items on the agenda that just while you're on the line, I, I would like to bring up at this time. The first one I wanted to just touch base on is is the um, the damage of a potential of the of the uh, individual who has caused damage. Uh, I think it was Friday. Has there Friday been evening. any is have to, has there been any leads uh, or any uh, arrests to that nature? Uh, no, not that has been brought to our attention. Um, the memorial, for many of you who may or may not know, uh, was damaged late Friday evening at approximately 10.30 p.m. It was captured on our security uh, video footage. Um, the individual stayed until roughly 1 a.m., uh, removed a number of the memorial items on the front steps of the former school, and uh, threw them and put some into the middle <clears throat> where the plaque is, um, and then took some shoes and put them in a perfect circle, uh, and then lit a fire and start throwing some of the items into the fire. That was all captured. The video footage was handed over to the city of Brantford police on Mon um, sorry Saturday. Um, when my team arrived on site for their weekend shift, uh, they noticed it right away at 10 a.m. when they arrived. Um, informed all the supervisors as well as myself. We called the police and they made the reports and um, they are now working with Six Nations Police to try to solve, um, but we have not heard any um, new information at this time. Community members arrived Saturday just on their own. We get visitors every day, as you can imagine, to the memorial. Um, and many, we don't take ownership of the memorial. We're just there to be there um, and try to keep it in a safe space. Um, but community members put it back. Um, so the memorial is back. Um, there are some items that were burned and damaged. So those had to unfortunately be um, uh, dis discarded, but uh, it is back. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Janice, for that update. It's so uh, obviously disheartening uh, to hear of such, such, a, such an event. Um, however, again, I think this you know, goes to show the, the education, the importance of education on, on this matter. Uh, to you know uh, all of Canadians in this nature. So I just wanted to provide uh, or to ask and get an update on on that issue. I do see Councillor Wendy has her hand up. Yeah, just on that note, um, I don't know about security, Janice. I mean, with you know things going forward with with developments, um, you know, I think it's another item on the agenda. But what about security, and is that something that we could help with as council to help 
keep the ground secure, make sure that everything is covered and, and protected moving forward. Yeah, we don't, we, we run a pretty lean ship up there. We don't have funds for security, um, overnight security. Um, so obviously that happened overnight. Um, but yeah, we definitely would be looking at um, getting uh, on-site security person to help prevent things like this. Uh, vandalism is not uncommon in our, in our area, unfortunately. Um, it's pretty high. We typically run into vandalism issues at least three times a year, just outside of the memorial. So is that something that we could look at, you know, finance could take a look at and see if we can find some funds to, to help support the center? Yeah, absolutely. That would be fantastic. I think that's a great, a great suggestion, uh, Wendy, even if it's, if it's looking to start, you know, for the weekend overnight hours type, you know, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, at least even to begin to see. Um, so maybe if we can just take a, I've, I've written a note down here as well to do for the follow up with finance. Uh, just to see exactly, and Janice, this is actually part of the uh, part of the discussions that we've had in terms of you know further assistance that we could be. Uh, so if this is one of them, obviously it sounds like it is. Uh, you know, yeah. we can definitely look to uh, to get that turned around uh, quite quickly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for providing that update. The other piece that I wanted to also uh, go to is we do have on the agenda as well is a uh, letter from uh, Loretta Nadal, uh, who is planning a walk from the Woodland Cultural Center to Toronto. I'm sure you're, you're already aware of this. Uh, and so I just wanted to, there, there, she's basically asking for permission, but I wanted to bring this forward again with you on the line, uh, because I, again, I think it's more along your, your, your role and your director's role to give that per permission. I don't necessarily think that's council's role. I don't, just wanted to know your thoughts on that piece. I know she is, and again, uh, really respectful of, of Loretta to to sign, uh, you know, send a letter and, and update us on this this walk that she is planning. I believe to begin August twenty seventh uh, to Toronto. That leaves the Woodland Cultural Center, um, and so just looking to uh, your advice or any thoughts on that letter. Um, just again, as it is an agenda item on our current uh, general council agenda this evening. Yeah, so as you can imagine, with everything that's happened over the last month, uh, we have received several requests for walks and events. So my team is working with um, every um, individual and organization and grassroots initiative to um, to work with them on that. Um, primarily, it's uh, typically with these walks, um, it's a logistical thing. We just tell them, you know, our, our spaces are closed to the public because of COVID. We can't really be open <laughs> that open with everyone um, due to the numbers. So we don't, uh, we do request uh, that they host these events after hours or on days that we are closed to the public and that um, they get third party liability insurance uh, for their event. And if it is a walk or a, a march of some kind, they need to inform the city of Brentford police and Six Nations police of their intentions. Okay, so I'm just wondering, Janice, if it's okay in council, if we can, and I apologize, I do recognize that there's, you're receiving many requests, uh, but if we can add one more to the pile. <laughs> Are you going to uh, give me another person to help with these requests? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's exactly what we wanted to also talk to this, this next, you just left, it was a perfect lead into the next conversation, uh, but really quickly, I see uh, Wendy has her hand up. Yeah, sorry, sorry about all the comments, but Janice, is, is that on your website, like a template for that? So we could actually, if this comes in, we could send them to the website and these are the steps that you have to take if you're going to do that. And um, yeah, not yet. It's currently being developed. Um, my team is dealing with a flood of inquiries right now. So yes, but a template is being developed. Okay, so uh, so thank you for that, Janice. And so I'll look to again. There's a there's a couple a couple items that we that we need to follow up with quite quite quickly, which is obviously the the extra assistance in that person. I know you did have one individual. Uh, is she back to her regular role, Christine? Yes, I uh, lost I lost my assistance, but yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so I know she was a great help, and uh, you uh, please pass on you know our appreciation for all of her work over the weeks that she's assisted us. Uh, so yeah. we will look to a person as well. I know, uh, Darren, if we can even make a note, our, our SAO, uh, perhaps maybe even in the interim, again, we can do almost like a secondment from one of our departments to assist. Uh, so we'll, we'll look to, again, turn around uh, that piece quite quickly. 
Yes, thanks, Chief. We do have a, a number of individuals who have offered to um, be remote, re repositioned or remobilized into this position. Um, we're just trying to work with, we're working with Tammy and my assistant as well as is working. Uh, and, and whenever the need is, we'll look to staff at. And if it's a new person we need to bring in, we're also looking at that as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for, uh, for that, Darren. So there's, an, as you can imagine, there's a number of items happening. I know even through the chief's office as well, we're doing our best to keep everything that we get in compiled into a clean list and so that we know exactly, you know, the requests coming in, what's being asked and so forth. Uh, and so we'll look to, again, uh, try to keep as clean of a, a list as possible and to try to assist you, Janice, as much as possible moving forward. Thank you. Uh, the other piece, uh, the last and final item that I wanted to discuss this is actually one of uh, Councillor Helen had, had brought this forward in relation to an update in relation to the search. So as you know, uh, Council, there has been a working group. It hasn't necessarily been formalized uh, per se. There's been a number of meetings held. Uh, we, we meet every Wednesday at two o'clock at the Woodland Cultural Center, obviously led by survivors. Uh, we do obviously need to do more outreach to more survivors. I know there's been some issues being raised. We've had multiple guests come into uh, our working group meeting. That's basically what we're calling ourselves at this point. Again, it's nothing formalized, but we, we do recognize that this is a huge undertaking and we have to have a clean plan of action. Uh, and so how we be strategic in our steps forward. So I know it's as, as everyone around the co country is moving ahead with their comprehensive searches and so forth. You now, obviously it's, it's, it's disheartening to hear even the latest one in Vancouver Island. Uh, you know, we, we recognize as well, you know, the importance of searching our grounds and the needs and prioritizing the areas of the search. Uh, obviously, you know, in, our, in the media that we've been in, uh, you know, that we're going down criminal investigation route and, you know, really taking that lead and direction from our survivors. Uh, as you can tell and see, the government, both Canada and Ontario, are, are, are heading down commemoration lane. Um, and that's not what we're saying at our working group. Uh, and so we need to really hold them to task. I know we've been in contact. We've had, we had a good meeting. I think I updated you on last, uh, our last council meeting with uh, Minister Bennett. Uh, and that was, uh, that was really started the ball in terms of getting our technical staff uh, on the same page and getting uh, applications in and so forth so that we could access the, the, the dollars, the $27 million announced. Uh, we haven't heard much from the province at this point in time. Uh, you know, it's obviously we've been a part of the announcement uh, in front of the Woodland Culture Center with the, the $10 million over the next three years that the province announced. Again, I think there are some issues there that, that aren't necessarily agreeable to Six Nations position. Uh, and so that we have to do further work, uh, political advocacy work on that. Um, however, we've had, we've, we have had uh, multiple guests come uh, to, to the working group. Uh, one, one being a very helpful, uh, a lady named uh, Wendy Fletcher, who is a historian, and perhaps maybe Janice, if, maybe if I could just uh, shift over to you really quickly, just to give a background to, to Wendy's role uh, when she first kind of came around the scene, uh, I think it was about 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and as to where she wants to assist uh, in now as well. Uh, yeah, so Wendy was, uh, I believe, uh, like a researcher with the Anglican Diocese and uh, was tasked with sort of going through some of these records of student records. Um, and through her research, she uncovered obviously some questions around um, missing children and, and their records. Um, and she, uh, uh, spoke to uh, a staff person who used to be employed at the residential school um, and straight out asked questions about these missing uh, children and questions around burials. So that she sort of has come forward through uh, one of the survivors um, to discuss, um, sort of provide that information, provide some background to the research that she did while she was working, working at the diocese. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that uh, background, Janice. And I think one of the goals as well as as we move forward is, you know, we, we have to do this as as cautiously and again, as strategically as possible. We know, again, the, the work is so, uh, it's so, uh, you know, emotional work. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're, we're not leaving out anything. And so one of those areas, I think, uh, just from the last meeting as well, uh, was just, you know, the inclusiveness of all survivors. Um, you know, there's been some uh, individuals who 
per se doesn't want council to lead this and that's respectable. And I, th I think that's something that is why we've you know, come up with this working group with so that it is community and survivor led. Um, and we're just basically there to advocate on their behalf. Um, so those are some of the questions as we're building this plan. There was also the criminal investigation part. There was a guest, uh, Mark Pritchard, I believe his name was last week, uh, who attended the working group. Uh, and there's some items that, you know, we need to look to in terms of legislation in relation to records as well, that could also look to part of the route. So um, maybe perhaps, I know Wendy, you did attend last week's meeting. Uh, are you able just to provide a quick background and uh, context to uh, Mark Pritchard's role? Because uh, there's many aspects to this entire plan and that's, that's one of them being the criminal investigation part. Sure, um, moving forward and, and I'll just start with, you know, the reason that we've been talking about the criminal investigation and death investigation is, you know, other communities may be ap approaching it with a search first and then making decisions later. But moving forward with a criminal death investigation, we're able to protect and preserve the evidence on the front end and make sure that we have everything intact so that we can bring justice forward if that's what has to happen. If that's, you know, ends up being the direction given by survivors and, and, and the community. But in, in doing this work, it's, it's unprecedented. It's uncharted territory. No one's done this before. And it's going to take working in collaboration with many agencies um, and working with different jurisdictions and authorities to make sure that we hold people accountable for all the harms, for the deaths, for all the wrongdoings that have been done. So Mark Pritchard is a, is a retired, um, very highly credited in investigator, um, criminal homicide investigation, serial killer, um, just, just ex extremely high experience. Um, in policing. So retired, um, he came in and he just provided some perspective and just talked about, you know, who he is um, and what he can do. So it, it's from a resource base, not to lead anything or anything like that, but it's simply to add resource on what is the process of investigation? What should we be looking at? What should we be including moving forward and, and looking at all of that? And there, there's a huge mapping exercise in terms of the scope of the work, making sure that the coroner's office is included, forensics is included. Now, do we have to look at um, international representation, people who are experienced investigators with genocide, um, with major death investigations, everything like that moving forward. How do we obtain the records and searching the records? So somebody like a Wendy Fletcher, she has that information, um, you know, having to turn that information over to obtain all the church records, because what we know, just going through the public records, there are 54 death reports over the entire span of the, the Mohawk Institute from 1829 until it closed in 1970, only 54 deaths were reported. And you can actually see some of the records because they don't all list the communication. And I'm happy to send it to any counselors who are interested that I pulled a couple and they're just gut-wrenching. And you can see there's so many questions. Um, but what we don't know when you look at the 54 is where, they're, where are they buried? So, I mean, it raises a number of questions. So, and it's all of that contained a, a wide move in, in terms of the criminal investigation, a death investigation, and being protected. And the, the front end of that is not a long process. The long process is actually, you know, being in the court system, holding people accountable. That's where the, it, it takes a bit longer, but the front end, that can happen quite quickly in starting that search from that avenue. But, but Mark Pritchard is just highly, um, he's highly recommended to be able to provide resource. And um, he, already, he already knows, you know, Chief of Police Darren Mentor and he knows many others. So he's quite well known in the sector. Yeah, I could go on, I've got, a I've got so much information on this, but uh, I'll stop there. No, yeah, thank you so much for providing that uh, that back background, Wendy, to that. And you know, there's again that just that just goes to show you the magnitude of this work, and that's only one aspect of this entire plan moving forward. So there's much work that needs to continue. Uh, but obviously, obviously, we again going back to Janice's point, we need people as well with the with the proper expertise to assist us in getting this work complete. 
So that's where we're at at this point. Again, it's going to be having to come back to be more formalized, I would say, uh, as our working group. Uh, but there's a number of items still being followed up with in relation to funding, in relation to expertise, in relation to, uh, you know, all of the items that, that we had mentioned earlier. Uh, and so really just wanted to provide an update as to the search. You know, our, I think our community is, is, is getting anxious as well as, you know, so we need to, we need to provide uh, update to community as to where we are uh, with this issue uh, and where we're going. And so that's really basically where we're at at this point in terms of the development of that plan and how we best move forward. So just really, uh, and Helen, that was for you as part of your, your update, uh, wanting an update in relation to the search. Uh, but again, uh, counselors, you are welcome to attend the, the uh, working group. Again, it is, it is uh, every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Uh, it has been, uh, you know, obviously survivor led and community led, uh, and we're really just there to help put together the plan so that it can be, uh, again, we can move forward in the best way possible. So I'm not, I'll pause there um, and maybe perhaps look to any questions or comments in relation to uh, that update. Okay, seeing or hearing none then, uh, again. Uh, oh, just one comment, Mark. Sure, sure, go ahead. Well, I was just going to recommend the hiring a project manager, but it sounds to me like you guys got it all under control. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's one of the key that's one of the key people that we're that we're finding at this point. Helen is is that project manager to to pull all these pieces together and really to recognize a number of positions needed after that, especially around admin support. So, uh, you know, that's all really the budget breakdown and what we got to do. So, yes, that's a key component. Are there any further questions or comments? Again, as, as Wendy alluded to, very uncharted territory. Uh, it's never been done. Uh, you know, it's, it's again, Janice, commend you and, and your team for all that you have been doing thus far. I know this, this work is very, uh, very emotional. It's very difficult at times. Uh, so just wanna also commend uh, and say thank you and to each of your team for all that you do. And we'll continue to look uh, on, again, how we can best support you moving forward. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Council, uh, that's all I have. Again, uh, I do apologize, Janice, I stole you for a little bit longer than <laughs> you were anticipated to come here this evening. Uh, so we did take care of uh, the letter from Loretta. Again, it was just, uh, it was very respectful on, on Loretta's behalf. You know, she had just come to, to follow protocol of the best that she knew. And so I'll look to uh, pass that or look to further uh, get in contact with Loretta on that, on that uh, walk. Uh, and we'll look to see you tomorrow at two o'clock at our next uh, our next working group meeting. Okay. Now okay. Th now I thank you so much, Janice. Have a great evening. You too. Okay, Council. That leads us into our next item on our delegation portion, which is Kathleen Montour from the Holistic Lifelong Care Across the Lifespan. Is Kathleen on the line? Good evening, Kathleen. How are you? And how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'll, I'll pass the floor right over to yourself. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we would just like to thank you, Chief and Council, for having us here today. Uh, we, would all, we would like to take this opportunity to provide a brief presentation on health system transformation and another presentation on the Six Nations Grand River Holistic Lifelong Care Across the Lifespan Engagement Plan. Uh, we first would like to start out with the presentation on what is health system transformation. So the agenda for this pre presentation will include uh, just a little information on the health system transformation team. We'll also provide some background and context of health system transformation, as well as health system transformation areas of focus, a little overview of the work order system, current initiatives, and uh, some time for question and answers. So our current core team members uh, for the health system transformation team include myself, Kathleen Montour, the health transformation project lead, 
My responsibilities include facilitating the planning, organization, and coordination of the designated health system transformation project by providing recommendations for future operational models for the delivery of health services in alignment with the Haudenosaunee wellness model and the strategic direction of Six Nations Health Services. Hi, my name is uh, Deanna White and I'm the uh, health transformation uh, research lead. And overall, uh, my role is to conduct research, program evaluation, assessment and surveillance activities to ensure that programs are informed by research, evidence and best practices. We also have uh, Marlon Hill on our team. He's the Health Transformation Project Assistant. He provides administrative and technical support in assessing, developing, implementing, and reviewing the goals and objectives of the Health System Transformation Project while contributing to the effective delivery of the project portfolio. We also have affiliates, uh, one being Sarah Curley Smith, who's the epidemiologist, uh, Natasha Simonti, the Mental Wellness Systems Coordinator, Nicole Bilodeau, the senior health promoter, and Chastity Vernivri, the health communications officer. Our, if, our list of affiliates will grow as the project develops, as everyone is a contributor to health system transformation. So our purpose is to redesign our healthcare system that ex exercises our inherent right to control and self-determine our health and wellness for Six Nations of the Grand River by effectively responding to community needs, priorities, and context. This is achieved through engagement and collaboration to help transform Six Nations of the Grand River healthcare system by coming together to develop and share knowledge. We have six guiding principles, the first being culture. So ensuring culture is the foundation of everything that we do. The second being collaboration to support meaningful engagement, collaboration, and relationships. The third being evidence informed, so to promote evidence informed decision making. And then we have empowerment, so to empower the community through self determination and control. And then there's transparency, so ensuring that we're transparent in all that we do. And then integration to support a coordinated and integrated approach to health practice. So the following slogan and logo was developed. Our slogan is transforming our voices into wellness through which signifies that the voices of our community are the foundation for defining the process of transforming our existing healthcare system to achieve the community's definition of optimal health and wellness within Six Nations of the Grand River. Our logo, the colors are reflective of the color scheme uh, for Six Nations of the Grand River or Six Nations Health Services and our border represents the unity and strength of the community in the process of transformation. The river represents our journey and the tree represents the balance of spirit, spiritual, physical, emotional, and mental health and wellness. So there are many definitions for health system transformation. Indigenous Services Canada defines it as a path forward to improved health outcomes for First Nations that includes high quality, culturally safe health systems that are designed by and under the leadership of First Nations. Uh, the Chiefs of Ontario through engagement sessions have defined health system transformation as wholesale change that results in First Nations exercising more control over the design delivery of their own health and wellness programming. Other First Nations uh, have defined it as bringing back accountability, responsibility and resource allocation to our communities that will change the current colonial system to a new system that is based on the needs and priorities of our communities. Through health system transformation, we will work together to define what that means for Six Nations of the Grand River. A preliminary definition could be that health system transformation is the revitalization of an evidence-informed, comprehensive, integrated, culturally appropriate, community-driven, patient-client-centered, outcome-focused health system within Six Nations Health Services that is based on Six Nations of the Grand River, community needs, priorities, context, promoting control and self-determination. Many things have occurred to facilitate the journey of transformative change. Uh, in 1996, the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Peoples made a statement that the starting place for health reform are, both, are for both levels of government and Aboriginal governments to commit to a new system that passes the levers of control to Aboriginal people. Moving forward in 2007, 
the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, was released highlighting the importance of all levels of government to support First Nations' right to health and self-determination in health. Specifically, Article 24 states Indigenous peoples have the right to their traditional medicines and to maintain their health practices, including the conservation of their vital medicinal plants, animals, and minerals. Indig Indigenous individuals also have the right to access without any discrimination to all social and health services. It also states Indigenous individuals have an equal right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health and state shall take the necessary steps with a view to achieving progressively the full realization of this right. And in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission summary report was released, specifically call to action 18 states all levels of government to acknowledge the current state of Aboriginal health in Canada as a direct result of previous Canadian government policies, including residential schools, and to recognize and implement the healthcare rights of Aboriginal peoples as identified in international law, constitutional law, and under the treaties. Also in 2015, the Minister of Health, Dr. Eric Hoskins, wrote to Ontario Regional Chief Day, committing to meaningful engagement with Indigenous partners through a parallel bilateral process, and that through collaboration, we will identify the changes needed. Ontario Regional Chief Day responded by supporting the parallel process, but also stating existing relationships and initiatives currently underway between First Nations and the Ministry are not impeded. Following year, in 2016, the Patients First Act was passed and described particular structural changes to the current healthcare system that will lead to a more local and integrated healthcare system aimed at improving patient experience and the deliver of higher quality care. In 2018, the Government of Canada announced taking major steps to improve health outcomes and access to health services through health system transformation investments in First Nations communities across Canada that will support First Nations in identifying and designing service delivery solutions tailored to their community's needs. In 2019, the People's Health Care Act was passed outlining the creation of a new central health agency called Ontario Health to oversee the province's health care system. The purpose was to inform an integrated care delivery system centered around patients, families, and caregivers through coordinated teams of health service providers. And most recently in 2020, Justin Trudeau announced a campaign to enact a distinction-based Indigenous health legislation to ensure the healthcare needs of Indigenous peoples is embedded in national legislation and policy and policies, which will be co-developed with First Nations leadership, providers, and citizens as part of their commitment to address the social determinants of health and advance self-determination in alignment with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So the Six Nations Health uh, System Transformation Process was first init initiated in 2018 uh, when Six Nations Health Services received funding from the Chief of Ontario, Chiefs of Ontario for the facilitation of the Achieving First Nations uh, Health Transformation in Ontario engagement sessions and surveys. These engagement methods were aimed to provide Six Nations healthcare providers and community members the opportunity to provide feedback on what changes or improvements they would like to see in a new model of health for First Nations. Also in 2018, discussions between Six Nations, the federal and provincial governments led to the development and signing of the Health System Transformation Relationship Agreement. The agreement outlines all parties' commitment to working in the spirit of partnership and reconciliation through collaboration and cooperation to reduce the significant health disparities and inequities between Six Nations individuals and families and non-First Nations peoples in Ontario. The agreement helped to facilitate the development of the Health Transformation Technical Working Group, which is a tri-party forum that was established to provide support, guidance, and oversight in the process of transforming the existing healthcare system into a holistic system that inspires Six Nations membership to achieve optimal health and wellness. The provincial and federal government supports Six Nations in the process of health system transformation by providing annual project funding based on the fulfillment of objectives and activities outlined within the project work plan and budget. So there are seven areas of health system transformation, including epidemiology, research, community engagement, policy, planning, 
evaluation and continuous quality improvement. So I'm going to briefly describe each of these areas. So first um, area is epidemiology. So epidemiology involves a process for ongoing evaluation and monitoring of the health status of six nations. Epidemiology is a core function of health services. For example, current initiatives within Six Nations of the Grand River include surveillance of population health indicators from ISIS and community population health assessments, for example, the Community Health Survey. The second area of focus is research. Research involves the collection, analysis, and interpretation of data from primary or secondary sources to ensure that programs and services within Six Nations Health Services are informed by research evidence and best practices. Some current initiatives within Six Nations of the Grand River include the HST research project. And the primary research question are factors, what factors facilitate or impede um, transformation. The third area of focus is community engagement. Community engagement involves meaningful engagement with staff, partners, community members, priority population, and other key stakeholders throughout the HTS, HST process. Current initiatives include the development of a networking and communication plan, establishment of a community health transformation working group, and the lifelong continuum of care project. The fourth area is policy. The HST team supports staff in policy development to ensure organizational policies and processes are progressive and supportive of an equitable, holistic, and self-determined healthcare system where government upholds legal obligations of First Nations rights to service delivery and access. The HST team also identifies and reviews legislative and policies at the national, provincial, and regional le level relevant to Six Nations to determine equitable entitlements to health. Some current activities include external policy reviews, and practice integration. The fifth area is planning. Planning plays a critical role in strengthening the broader health system within Six Nations of the Grand River. It ensures that programs and policies are developed in advance and is an ongoing process used to modify programs and services throughout its lifespan to achieve specific outcomes. This can be achieved through the utilization of planning tools. For example, the HST team is actively engaged in the application of a strategic tool from NUCA. This is an innovative solution to improve organizational function. The sixth area is evaluation. The purpose of evaluation is to develop pro programs and services that are informed by evidence as an ongoing cycle of CQI or continuous quality improvement. Currently, the HST team supports staff with current evaluation, evaluation initiatives, including creating data collection tools and analyzing the data and communicating the results of the findings. The HST team also collaborates with academic partnerships on evaluation activities. The last area is continuous quality improvement. The purpose of CQI is to ensure the systematic collaborative and continuous efforts of the entire organization to make evidence-informed changes that would lead to better health and wellness outcomes for Six Nations of the Grand River. Some current initiatives include the development and implementation of an HST work order system, which I'll discuss more in depth on the next slide. Apologies. So the work order system um, was launched on June uh, 28th. It is a tool to support staff for all areas of HST that I previously uh, discussed. For example, if a staff person would like support in developing an evaluation plan for their program or services, they would complete a form indicating this and a member of the HST team would respond to the request within 48 hours. And this tool was adapted from the South Central Foundation and professional practice. So as I mentioned, some current initiatives include the Community Health Survey, the development and implementation of 
of an HST networking and communication plan, the holistic lifelong care across a lifespan engagement plan, which we will provide a PowerPoint presentation on. Uh, also the um, HST community birth booth during Community Awareness Week, also the HST Research Project, and ongoing revision of the health plan for 2021. So I think I'll open, um, respectfully open the floor if, if um, you have any questions or answers, and we will provide the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Deanne and Kathy. Really appreciate your, your presentation. We will look for any uh, questions or comments at this point in time. It's a lot. There's a lot of work happening. I think. I think this is the whole. Just if I can start, maybe uh, the whole term transformation is a very, uh, from my point of view, personal point of view a very cautious word. Uh, yeah. And the reason I say that is because you look across the board on multiple files uh, and what the government is doing is they're, they're transforming a lot of other areas. Uh, and what exactly that means is the fine print that we need to, to read and understand very clearly as a community. Um, so those, you know, that, that's, that's right away my main concern is the terminology on transformation itself. I know it looks great. It looks like, you know, they're in co-development. I've never heard, you know, as much as reconciliation to co-development to transformation in the last, you know, couple of years as, as popular as, as, as those words have been. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I myself uh, think we have to be uh, very optimistically cautious uh, as we uh, do go down this route, because again, uh, I know I, I see Audrey's, we've been using that word a lot, optimistically cautious. You know, it's, 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 a, it's by virtue of, again, just maybe we have to look at the bigger picture here, right? And so what does that mean entirely from what the government standpoint is uh, that they're doing? Not just specifically within health, you know, but, you know, within, within justice, within social, within a, num a number of areas. And so that's, again, just, I, I, I'll start with, with those comments, but appreciate the presentation uh, in each of you for joining us. Uh, I do, I want to shift over to uh, Councillor Nathan and then I'll shift over to Councillor Helen. Yeah, thanks Chief. And I, I agree uh, with your assessment on, on the caution. And um, at least from my perspective, this is devolution. Um, this is the total right. devolution of the um, federal fiduciary responsibility in downloading. And, and I don't feel they've given us the tools um, at this point. Um, I know there's, there's, and I've been a part of processes, be it um, more at the regional level and the national level, uh, where these discussions have been held, um, chaired a number of these meetings. Um, and, and it's, it's and, and the cautious approach should be, should be taken. And I'm not taken away from this, this uh, the work that's been done. This is uh, amazing work that uh, we now have um, a lot of this um, this uh, this process in place and, and translating it in, in terms of our needs because we're we're so different than than any other First Nation that's that's partaking in this. But I do see that pathway um, for us, and and I believe it is in ensuring that as we go down this path, as we continue as a council to get educated and, and move forward on, on this devolution process, um, that we do begin and, and put our foot in the door to start that negotiation process. Because I see this as that negotiation going forward, um, strictly for us. Uh, and I do, and I um, kind of, uh, know that a number of First Nations groupings, whether it be by treaty or whatnot, have, have started this work that we can um, look at in terms of seeing, you know, what didn't work and what has worked from their perspective. Uh, and this is the, the allyship that I talked about in terms of being able to reach into communities uh, like Anishinaabe Aski Nation who have done this work um, and are down a path. Um, to hear from them and, and get their perspective as well. 
um, this is hugely important for us um, going forward. Uh, and, and I think um, this presentation gives us that good, solid um, jumping off point for us to start uh, down that path. Uh, but I do believe this is, um, in, in all my experience working in this field, um, this is a devolution of the responsibilities. Uh, and I think we need to um, cautiously move forward, um, but then come from a strong position of strength uh, as we look to start a negotiation process. Uh, once we do our, our homework and get our ducks in order and come up with that strategy. So um, thank you for the work and thank you for the presentation. I think it's very timely and uh, look forward to uh, continuing on on this while as we as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for, for your comments. Uh, I'll now shift over to Helen and then over to Audrey. Yep, what Nathan took the word right out of my mouth. It's devolution. Um, and I have major concerns about what's happening because it's not only health, it's all different programs and services. They're doing it with housing. They're doing it with education. They're doing it with everything. They're transferring their responsibilities to First Nations under the, the guise of, oh, we can control our own programs. We control our services. We can do all these wonderful things for our people because we're going to have the freedom to do all this stuff. But the one thing they're not transferring is the money. And that's my concern. We're not going to be self-sufficient. They're trying to pass it off as us being self-sufficient and self-government and all that stuff. But you're not going to be that way if you don't have the money. They're going to control the money. And that's my major concern. And another thing I think what they're doing is they're setting up these First Nation organizations or institutions to deal with the money, they're gonna deal with the money and then give it out to all the First Nations. It's gonna be like a, a lens, a brown lens, I think. That's my understanding. And then all of us are gonna fight that lens for the money. That's what's down the road. And, and they're calling it co-developed. That, that's, that's BS, it is not co-developed. They're holding six week engagement sessions and they're calling that code development. Oh, we listened to you. We heard everything you want to say. Uh, we're going to go back and do this. And Because uh, they're doing it with housing. That's how come I know the, the same pattern that they followed with health. They're following with housing right now as we speak. And I know they're doing it with education. They're giving everybody all kinds of money to say, oh, here, go and do your engagement sessions, go do all this wonderful stuff and develop all of these things. We're giving, they're throwing money at everybody. And that's why a lot of the First Nations are taking it because they're throwing money at everybody. And my concern is they're gonna control the money. Unless we can control the money, unless Six Nations can get its own big pile of money to do health, then I don't see any good coming out of this. And I remember councils back in the 1960s, they fought diligently against devolution because they've been trying to do that ever since then. So I have a real concern with this and I, I, I just really have a concern with it. And I think we really need to sit down with our health director and talk about what is really going on here and what are we going to do about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen, for your comments. Uh, I'll now go to uh, Councillor Audrey and then over to Councillor Wendy. Uh, thanks, Mark. And I agree with uh, what Nathan is saying and, and Helen. I too am cautiously optimistic about what we do, but I would like to commend the health services for the work that they've done so far. They are really uh, taking ownership of this and uh, trying to make it ours. And that's, I think, one of the most important things that we have to meet the needs of our Six Nation members. And that's what we're trying to do here. But the money has to be there. We did attend one of the housing workshops where the, the chief said that housing is already underfunded. Why would you take it over only to handle an organ or a system that's already, you know, is underfunded? And that's the same reason why we never took over education before because it was always underfunded, still is now. And we will, won't be taking it over until we have the money to meet our needs. So health 
Um, we, we thought that we at our last human services meeting that it's time to bring this all out to the, the community. So I'm, I'm thankful for this presentation tonight. You, you uh, did follow through with that. So that the council is updated and the community after today, if, if they're, it's being live streamed, many community members will know where we're heading right now. And I guess my biggest concern is to get that communication plan going and to make sure that we can try and engage as many voices from our community as possible. People who have struggled with health uh, problems, um, whether things are working well, we need to know that, but also things that are, aren't working well, we need to know so that we can accommodate people's needs in this um, process moving forward. And it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of people in order to, to make this happen. And the funding, I agree with Helen, the funding has to be there in order for us to meet the needs of Six Nations members. Nyawa. Okay, thank you, uh, Nyawa Audrey, for your comments. Uh, Councillor Wendy. We take the uh, PowerPoint down so that we can see people. Um, I, I get, I, and, and I agree. I mean, I have concerns as well. I mean, I, I see the extensive work that has been done. I guess I, I have questions of, you know, and I'm sure the council before us has you know, you've gone through the exercise of what does this mean? How did we get into the whole transformation uh, plan in itself? Because absolutely, to Audrey's point, we have to identify what the needs of this community are. What does our own health wellness service look like moving forward? Is there a way that we can do that and identify that outside of jurisdictions, outside of buying into something that's being sold to us. When I read the briefing note and I look at the first, first statement, the government of Canada is prioritizing an anticipated release of funding for the transformation of health services through the Treasury Board of Canada, pol policy options co-designed by First Nations to address current health and social service gaps and the needs along a continuum. So to, to me, that's a done deal. If that's going to Treasury Board and it's already in place, it, it's a done deal. So it doesn't matter what we come up with. I mean, Helen is right on. The funding is what the funding is. So when I look at non-insured health services and all of the restrictions and all the limitations and people can't get glasses, they can't get dental care, you know, medications, everything's being cut and we can't get those services. Do we think that we're going to get those services under health transformation and going down that road? What we do is we inherit all the restrictions and all the limitations. So I agree with Nathan as well that we should be negotiating. What does this mean? If we start to look at this, then what are we getting in this process? Are they gonna make sure that we've got adequate coverage at the onset to move that forward? And I think we should be really looking at it in that vein because my big question with this is, what are we signing on to? By taking the money, by doing the engagement, what does that mean from that political, from that risk assessment, from that side of it? And I'm not seeing that in any of, any of the information. And I agree. I mean, people have been doing this work, other nations. So we should be talking to them quite a bit before we even commence this work to say, what happened? What are the issues? You know, what should we be looking at? What are those plagues? And doing that envir environmental scan before we even get into this. So I have a lot of questions as well. I know we have to define because we have jurisdictions. I mean, this is FNIP. What about the province? What, what about everything in between? So we really need to, I think, dissect this a little bit more and define what it means. What are the impacts to us moving forward? Because if we have all of these questions, I mean, going to the community, I mean, I think this is going to be very, complicated and and as I said if we have all these questions I mean they're, they're just going to grow and I have a real issue with the acronym I don't think we should be calling this the HST team I think that is just wrong on so many levels okay thank you uh thank you Wendy for your comments as well are there any further questions or comments from any of the counselors that have not had the opportunity
Again, Kathleen and, and Deanna, again, just want to say now and thank you for your presentation. But as you can see, there are there are some glaring concerns. And I think it's more it's 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 above in a sense of more political. Um, and so we have to really uh, establish our position moving moving forward from this point. I know uh, recommendation obviously 4B1 is, is just to get to your presentation. So I wasn't looking at 4B1, but recommendation 4B2 uh, reads that the Human Services Committee recommends to Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council to approve continued engagement in the holistic lifelong care across the lifespan project with key partners within the engagement activities. But I think, you know, to Wendy's point, it's something that needs to be thoroughly clarified what exactly that means when signing on to these engagements. As we know uh, from many, many times in the past, you know, when we go into any meetings uh, with government, uh, you know, right away, there's many first ages that, that clearly state this is not to be misconstrued with consultation. Right. And I think this is also another area. And I know that there's that's where they add in these words of co-development and all these other, you know, government terminologies. Um, but again, I think it's there. We have to be very cautious in terms of the fine print here and what this exactly means. So I think politically and again, I'm going to go back to our, our follow up retreat, because this is exactly what is the conversations that we need to be having as a collective bigger picture in terms of where we're hitting across the board. As, as you've heard from Councillor Helen, this is not only happening in health, this is happening in housing, it's happening in education, it's happening in social, all across the board. So we know that there's something bigger, a bigger shift happening politically. Now we have to make sure we're doing our best to position ourselves so that it does meet the best needs of our community. And we do put all of our community needs and prioritize each of those so that it fits within the bigger collective picture. So. I just want to look for council's direction at this point in time to see how you would like to proceed because I, again, I think uh, you know with our our follow up retreat, these are the discussions exactly what with what we plan to have uh, in developing our next two year strategy or midterm strategy here. Um, I see Councillor Nathan has his hand up, and then over to Councillor Helen. Nathan, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks, Chief, and thanks for kind of laying it out in, in that manner, because I think you're right. I, I think there are those those political issues, and, um, and, and, and I just reiterate my comments that, um, you know, the work that's been presented and been done is a fabulous, you know, strong jumping off point for us um, to, to begin doing that political work. Um, and, and that's something to... Um, in terms of looking at um, kind of an environmental scan as, as that first step um, so that we have a good grasp of, you know, not only what we're doing from our perspective, but also breaking down the realities and, and the nuances of what governments do. Uh, because, you know, they use the word of health transformation and, and they use these, these buzzwords of the day. Um, but uh, as we've all said, this is devolution. Like we know what it is and, and we can see it in, in as clear as day. Um, so I think, uh, you know, bringing us uh, together and, and bringing that information together, uh, not only us, but what other nations are doing as well in their path and their story. You know, I'm, I know Ovid Mercury could probably do a bang up job of uh, giving us uh, some, some tips and, and a journey that he's been undertaken with Nishnabiaski Nation on, on their work um, so that we can um, wrap our, our collective minds around this going forward. So I see that as, and, and maybe the retreat's a good spot to, to kind of do that information dump uh, so that we can hear other perspectives, hear from ourselves, look at the information and dissect it um, and, and then move forward from there um, in developing a negotiation kind of strategy next. Uh, so you, you ask for next steps. I think that's kind of, uh, at least from my perspective, it's that information dump to, uh, to, to kind of uh, di digest and dissect what's happening here. I agree. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for, for providing those comments as well. Uh, Helen. Yeah, I just, I, I, I have a real, I, mean, I have a real issue with this. So, and I apologize to, uh, uh, Deanna and Kathleen and who else is with them? I'm, I'm not looking, I'm not blaming you guys for anything. It's just the government. And 
So I, I just wanted to say that, like, I think you did a really good presentation of the work you've done to date, but it's just my issue is with the government. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Helen. I, I did hear Councillor Hazel, and I'll shift back over to Councillor Wendy. Yeah, I would just like to um, also say that Health did do this presentation at Human Services Committee, and it is a very good presentation. And that devolution word is scary for all First Nations. And it's true what Helen says, they're doing it with our housing, education, health, and that's where we have to be very wary of what their intent is. And I'm just wondering, like, if other First Nations are going ahead, it seems like the government gives you this task to do, uh, and then basically saying, um, you know, we're still going to control the money. That in itself is a bad, bad position. And I'm wondering if we could do a position paper on this very topic to the government to say, we know what you're doing and we need to talk about enough money. So there's never any, um, sorry, my dog, don't listen to me. Um, that any intent will always, there'll always be enough money um, to deal with the situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments as well. Uh, Wendy. Yeah, and, and I agree with Helen's comments. I mean, this has nothing to do with, with the staff that are in place. This is at a, you know, at a level of overall in terms of the risk assessment and, and the impact. But, you know, I, I'd certainly like to see, I know Lori had to leave, but I see Janet's on. I don't know if there's already information in terms of what those impacts are, where this comes from. I guess I'm interested in the strategy. How do we address this? Knowing what we know, and I, I mean, we all seem to be in agreement with this and what this means and, and potential risks. So what is the strategy going forward? Because at some point we do have to address the gaps. We do have to address the needs in the community. So how do we approach that? And the fact that, you know, if, if there's a treasury board submission already on its way, then we need a strategy to deal with that as well. So I don't know if, you know, Darren and Lori or, or just in terms of that avenue as well, if there's any type of a policy or, or document that's been already done and completed. Did you want me to speak to that at all? My, my apologies, sorry. Uh, yes, if you can uh, respond, uh, Janet, to that would be great. Thank you. I know that like Lori for sure would be the best person to respond to the question. So. Um, what I'll do is make sure that I forward that to her. Um, having said that, I, I think so one, of, one of the other, I wrote the note down, one of the other counselors mentioned like there, I think there's still some real benefit to the process in that, you know, there's a lot of work and maybe Kathleen can kind of point to it as well as just the capacity for engagement and to identify, you know, what does the community really need in terms of a health system? Um, I think they're like, yeah, not discrediting the, the concern around um, devolution, but um, there is a real opportunity here too. So I just don't want that to get lost. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Janet. I see a number of hands up. Sorry, I'll just shift back over to Wendy, then over to Darren. Yeah, j just to that comment, I mean, yes, we, we should go through the exercise of, of you know, engagement and finding out input from the community, but at what cost? So that's what I think we're all talking about, you know, by signing on and the engagement and taking the money, do we already go into the process um, and what that means? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that clarifying point, Wendy. Uh, Darren. Yeah, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to reiterate that point that you know, it, it, and we'll look at the fine print. I think that is the key, the key point, uh, Chief, that you mentioned early on. Um, and I think the retreat is a good place to do not just a position paper on health, but across all sectors. As a government, we talk about, we always blame the government, but guess what? We're a government. We need to stand up and assert that. And that's the way we can do that. It's not just with health transformation, it's education. It's with everyone speaks, spoke about housing. 
So I think that's an opportunity for us to look at that and really come out really strong um, across as a government and say, you know, you know, you're in, and we in whatever the terms are of this agreement, um, we can go back and revisit those. I mean, if there's, I guess it talks about Treasury Board, I agree, that was kind of glaring, um, but I think it's just an intent, um, but we need to clarify that what their intent is. And here's our intent, by the way. Uh, so that's kind of how we, we address it. That's just my my two cents. And, and certainly we can look at not just health, but other sectors at the retreat and look at that positional, uh, those positional statements. I see Christopher's on, on the call as well. He can, he can really assist us with putting those, those pieces together. So I just wanted to confirm, I agree uh, in the path forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Darren, for your comments as well. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? Again, I just want to reiterate to, to Deanna and Kathleen again, it's been, uh, you know, it's, it was a great presentation and thank you for all that you presented on. Uh, it's just a matter, I think, more of a political, uh, you know, upper political position that we need to have further discussion on. Um, and so we'll look to those pieces. I don't necessarily, by what I'm hearing, I don't feel that we need to uh, approve recommendation 4B2 at this time. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, any counselors, uh, but just by virtue of the conversation, uh, I think it's a, it's important of the next steps that were just laid out that we look to uh, go to the what the true intent of that means uh, and perhaps bring this back at the next meeting and then have further conversation at our upcoming follow-up retreat. Is there any opposition to that direction? Okay, seeing or hearing none, uh, again, just want to say nyawa and thank you, Kathleen and Deanna, and to uh, all the rest on the call, Janet, uh, who's joined us this evening. Uh, we will have a further conversation and we'll look to more of a bigger, broad uh, direction conversation where we can then further uh, get back to you and, and, and look to next steps. Yes, thank you for your time and your feedback, everyone. Thank you. Very thank much. you so much. Have thank a great you. evening. Bye now. You too. Okay, Council, that leads us into our agenda item number five, which is the adoption of the General Council Minutes of June 22nd. I'll move, Sherlyn. Okay, thank you, uh, Sherry Lynn. It's moved by Sherry Lynn. Is there a seconder? Second, Nathan. Second by Nathan. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. We've dealt with number six, uh, which was the letter from Loretta from the Walk for the Woodland Culture. That was part of Janice's presentation. Uh, so we'll move to number seven, which is a request for a political representation on the Keyway First Nations Heritage and Burial Sites Working Group. Uh, at Council, that this is within your packages on your Dropbox. Again, uh, as, as uh, some councillors may have been aware, this is really, uh, I know uh, former councillor uh, Barb Harris, uh, always did this work uh, at this uh, working group. I know it's obviously go probably going to maybe even be amplified further with even the current work that's happening with the recoveries of our children and so forth, but uh, they are requesting a political rep uh, at this working group. Uh, just wanting to look to, we, we would bring this forward obviously for discussion uh, and look to next steps. So opening it up for any questions or comments. I see uh, Wendy, then over to Nathan. Yeah, I have a lot of issues with this. When I read the materials, it, it seems to give a whole lot of authority and a whole lot of power to this group. And I, I think there's huge impact too with what's going on with recovering you know, the, the children. And because of the work and the partnership and the co-work with the government, Will they be able to determine what happens? Will they be dictating to us what happens going forward? So I've got a huge concern with how that's mapped out and the process that they're proposing. Um, and I don't, 
I think we should be raising more questions rather than assigning a rep there. But that's my perspective. And then in line with, and I, I see it in the Dropbox, the return of ancestors project. So I don't know if that's tied to it because there's nothing else on the agenda associated with it. But, but even that, I've got issues with that. Thank you. I'm just uh, going through all the documents. Yeah, I believe is that that's the attachment to. Yeah, sure. Surely we'll confirm on that piece, Wendy, to, to clarify the attachment to uh, the keyway. Uh, I'm, I'll, while she's doing that, I'll shift over to Nathan. Yeah, similar comments to Wendy. Um, and so I, I, I'm the one that started this committee way back in 2008. That's how long this committee's been in existence. Um, and uh, as committees do, they, they have progressed. And uh, I do see this one in its current form. And what I read, and I'm just basing it what I, off of what I've read, is it seems to be overstepping the authority of individual First Nations. Um, and, and I think that, uh, uh, I, I don't know that it was uh, intentional on, on Ku's part or, or the committee chair or, or however that happened. Um, but um, I, I, I think this is something we need to kind of take a step and step back and take a really good look at uh, for the same reasons that Wendy kind of highlighted, right? We, we envision that there's going to be that long process, especially in Ontario, as it relates to, you know, our bringing our children home uh, in that process as well. Um, what is concerning to me is the ministry, the involvement of Ministry of Culture, Tourism and Sport um, and, and the, the amount of influence I'm reading into, uh, and again, I'm just reading into it, but I'm reading into it a, a huge influence by this particular ministry. Uh, and again, I, I feel it's an overstep, uh, a massive overstep, even, even to have care and control and, and not being, uh, if this committee has been in place since 2008 and they still have ancestors and, and our objects and our sacred items, um, you know, that, that speaks to me about a number of, of jurisdictional issues, care and control. And I understand repatriation is a long process. I've, I've been a part of a number of them um, myself. Uh, but at the same time, you have to be able to demonstrate and show progress, especially with something like this. Um, so uh, in, in reading everything, especially like the return of our ancestors project, um, you know, it, it doesn't go into the, the ceremonial aspect of all, which I think has to be front and center. And maybe they just didn't want to write into a briefing note, but you, you have to give that indication that the ceremonial and, and the sacred aspects of this work is, is being conducted and it's done and it's being done by the right people. So I, I could go on and on and on, um, but I think we need to, to take a really critical lens to this. Uh, and, and as Wendy highlighted, formulate our questions, get our questions and concerns responded to. Um, and then um, if we do make that determination, if we make that determination, uh, to put a rep there going forward. But uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I see red flags across the board. I see red flags in the future and the work that we have to do and um, just want us to, to formulate our questions, get them answered, uh, addressed, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for your comments as well. I see Audrey has her hand up. My, my basically a statement, I think along the same lines as Nathan and, and Wendy, I, I believe uh, I envision this as Six Nations was going to do this themselves with the largest First Nations in Canada by population. And we have the experts here. We have all the traditional knowledge, all the language we have it here. And I think it'll be dealt with a, a lot more sensitively. And I think that we can do it. So I have faith in our community to handle this. And if you want to put somebody on there as an ex officio member, that's fine. But I envisioned us as doing this for ourselves. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Audrey, for, for your uh, comments as well. Just really quickly, uh, I see Helen has her hand up. Uh, yeah, just briefly, uh, when Barb was doing it, she used to just make sure that anything came back to Six Nations that was supposed to. And 
she would get the people to do all the ceremonies to, to bring them back and rebury them. There's a little cemetery over on Painter's Road somewhere. I can't tell you exactly where right now, but it's over there somewhere where she would take uh, the remains or whatever it was that came back. And she handled all of that, but I know she got the proper people to do the, the, the burials and stuff like that ceremonies and everything but that was this one sounds like it wants to go a lot further than what I recall Barb doing so I, I don't know if it's changed since and that's this is you know been a few years since she was around so it sounds to me like it might have morphed into something else since Barb used to sit there Thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen. So just perhaps, I'm not sure, if, uh, Nathan, if you have your hand up again for a question, but just before I go back to you, I'm wondering if maybe this, just by virtue again of the conversation, this is something that we can have Jill, uh, Jill take a look further into and develop the concerns and the questions and, and revert back to uh, the working group, and then we'll get a status report from that. And I'm just wondering on if that's the best direction at this point in time. Okay, I'm not seeing any opposition. So that's what we'll do with this council uh, is we'll, we'll assign this to, to Jill as, as uh, part of her, her work to do some more due diligence and bring this back to council just to raise uh, you know, some of those concerns in which uh, Wendy, Audrey, Nathan, that which you've all uh, have alluded to. So we'll bring this back for further uh, conversation. I see uh, Nathan just really quickly wanted to check in with you if you had anything further. Yeah, just one more point on on this as as I was doing the work in the past um, and why it was important to have that unity and kind of regional perspective on this is uh, our ancestors as well as our sacred objects aren't necessarily within our territory. Um, there, there is far up and, and it's been found up in Muskego territory as well. And um, it, it was interesting. I, I, I've uh, just a little tidbit here. Um, I always wondered why the town Iroquois Falls was called Iroquois Falls, and I kept looking for the falls, and it's not, there's no actual falls there. But that's the place, that's as far as the Iroquois have made it. So again, a number of our sacred items were found there um, and repatriated, and I'm sure Barb was part of that process, but uh, it was just like our, our people, our ancestors, and our objects are everywhere, and I think that's the uh, importance of having uh, a regional perspective on this so that uh, we, uh, uh, we we maintain those connections. And um, yeah, there's just tons of stories I could go on and on and on, but uh, very interesting pile, to say the least. Wow. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for that insight. Uh, again, I know there's, it's, that's a, I think it's even going to be even more sensitive as, as we approach, you know, the work with, you know, recovering our children. So this is, I think, timely to have these concerns raised and questions answered. And so we'll, we'll, we'll get Jill right to work as soon as possible on, on this as well. Uh, Sherry Lynn. Well, I think in the meantime, um, we need to, to get our own working group with, Lon with Lonnie's office, the, the archaeology department. I think we need to really start beefing that up and getting our own working group started instead of waiting for Chiefs of Ontario. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And in fact, I think there is, and Lonnie is on the line. Lonnie, are you uh, able to uh, just comment really quickly on, on the work? Because I know that has to, to Helen's point, uh, shifted from, from when Barb had the file. Not sure if Lonnie, if you're available, are you on the line? I don't know if he's on the line or not yet, but again, yeah, here I am. I am here. Uh, oh, here Mark. Sorry, sorry, yeah, we, we, we did have a meeting of uh, a virtual meeting last week uh, of uh, some of the uh, First Nations who are involved with this. It was organized by the Chiefs of Ontario, and uh, it was just getting started again after a long hiatus uh, uh, during the pandemic. They hadn't been meeting at all, so uh, it uh, they're scheduled for another meeting. I know our, our my uh, our not my but our uh, uh, archaeology supervisor uh, Tanya Hillman Tor was on the call as well. So when this becomes involved more at the uh, the uh, 
the lower level of the people who actually work in the field, she'll be the one who will be uh, participating in, in, the, in the Chiefs of Ontario meetings of the, uh, uh, the people on the ground, I guess. Uh, uh, I wasn't aware that there was, this was coming about a political appointment, uh, uh, but I guess that's something now that council can, can consider uh, in light of this thing, it's just starting to get going again. Thanks, uh, thanks, Lonnie, for for your comments. Uh, I see Wendy has her hand up. Yeah, I, I mean, we I think we have a direction forward, but I, I, just a caution to say that I think we have to be care, careful not to um, not not to muddy the water, so to speak, because I mean, artifacts are very important and, and to repatriate those. But if we're talking about uh, burials, if we're talking about um, remains then that's completely different. And Mark, you said it in terms of what's going on in, in recovering the children and, you know, not to, archeology span is one piece of it, but we're crossing over into something entirely different. And we really have to exercise that caution around that and crossing over and, and mixing that. I, I agree 100%. Thank you for that, Wendy. Uh, okay, Council, uh, so that we do have direction on this piece, uh, we will look to next steps uh, and, and provide uh, Jill uh, some background in, uh, and to get some more due diligence done on this specific file uh, and bring this back to Council. Uh, that now shifts us into our under scheduling on our agendas. Uh, so we do have a tripartite uh, collaborative technical table on enforcement and prosecution of First Nations laws. Uh, which is happening on Wednesday, July 21st. I do see there's been some emails back and forth. Um, so we are looking for uh, a represent representative to, uh, to go and attend uh, this uh, technical table. So there, the briefing is within your Dropbox. Really just want to open it up for discussion and, and next steps and where we go from here. Sherry Lynn? Chief, this is the one that, um, I, that council put me on, but I just wasn't, I'm not able to make this, this uh, meeting because they canceled June. And um, so I just can't make this meeting. So if someone can can um, go to this meeting, that would be great. That's okay, all. thank you. Uh, thank you, Sherry Lynn, for bringing that forward. Is there anyone available on this date to, to attend in, in Sherry Lynn's absence? It's on Wednesday, uh, July 21st from 2.30 till 4 p.m. I see Helen is, Helen is, are you agreeing to attend? Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, for that, Helen. So we will pass you all of uh, Tammy. We'll send along all of the details uh, for that meeting. Uh, and thank you again for for stepping in for uh, for Sherry Lynn. So we'll we'll look to uh, we'll look to a, a report on that piece. I know there's a lot of things even moving in that area. Sherry Lynn, you've been great at at sitting at that technical table. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing there. Um, and we'll look to to Helen's uh, involvement at this meeting. Uh, that leads us into obviously this evening, uh, General Council. Uh, tomorrow is building an infrastructure. Uh, into next week is our General Finance, which is on the 19th, uh, as well as Corporate Emergency Services. Uh, and then towards the last week is, is uh, no council meetings are booked during that week, uh, which will be somewhat of our first summer break. Uh, into political updates. And um, again, there's, I'm sure there's much more in our individual calendars. Uh, but that's more for full council and full council meetings. Uh, so we'll, we'll update again, even for the next month as we, uh, as we progress. Uh, in terms of just quick political updates, I've already mentioned this as well. I did have finally had a phone call with Minister Mark Miller last week uh, in relation to Gawaneel School and setting a date for, for the meeting. So he has confirmed that that was uh, last week. Within two to four weeks, we'll, we'll, we will have a secure date that the board uh, we'll meet with the minister and his staff, as well as any uh, counselors who are available to attend. Uh, we again have not received the final set date as of yet, uh, but it is in the work. I have even received a text message from his chief of staff, again, uh, advising that this is a priority and we'll look to get this meeting scheduled as soon as possible. Uh, so just really in by virtue of quick political updates there. I already updated in terms of our, our meeting that was going back a couple of weeks with Minister Bennett. So I updated that through our Woodland Cultural um, our comprehensive radar search that we're looking to do at the Mohawk Institute. Uh, so that that file in itself, Council, is, is huge. And uh, so as soon as we can get that team and plan 
together and actionized and implemented, uh, that's when we'll start to see really a lot of the work uh, get moving quite quickly. Um, other than that, I want to move right in, if I can, just really quickly while I'm on the topic of, of Minister Miller and Gawaneel School, perhaps maybe I can go over to new business and start with you, Wendy, uh, on your item of the Gawaneel School. Sure, thanks, Mark. So at the, uh, at the July 5th political liaison meeting, there was some um, miscommunication, I guess, with who was hosting the meeting. So I couldn't get into the meeting until the open session was do done. So I got into the in camera session and I had advised council that I had an agenda for open, but you know, I thought timing was important. So I, I brought it up in camera um, and assured council that I would, I would raise it in, in open. So I, I talked about going to go school and how we always talk about providing support and doing things, we don't actually action that. So I put a motion on the floor to uh, provide Gawaneo school with $2 million so that they can start to do some work with the build of the new school. And uh, that went through, the motion went through with, with one opposing and second reading was waived on that. So that's in process. So I just wanted to make sure that it was open and um, nothing was done in, in camera. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, for that, Wendy, and to council as well uh, for providing uh, those funds to start. I know, again, we're pushing along uh, with government to, to get that school built as quickly as possible. I know everybody is uh, working tirelessly, both on you know, the board at the chief's office, uh, counselors, et cetera. Uh, and so that was really a, a, a gracious donation uh, to get the project started as quickly as, quickly as possible. I seen Helen had her hand up, so I'll just touch base with Helen. Really. Yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know I was, Wendy had said there was one opposed, that was me. I opposed being this simply because of the money part, didn't know where the money was coming from. And my concern was if we then, if we give them $2 million and they can't get the money to build a school, what happens? So I oppose that. I don't oppose the school, I just oppose giving them $2 million. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Helen. Uh, so we will look to, again, uh, again working as tirelessly as we can to get Gawaneo. We, we recognize the importance, especially even more so now, the importance of our languages. Uh, you know, when, again, what we're um, recovering with our, our children and the atrocities committed at residential schools, obviously, to strip language and culture from, from our people. So we recognize and understand the importance of making sure that we are doing everything we can to save our languages. So know that it is a priority, know that there's much work happening and that we will continue this work as we uh, progress and get their school built. So thank you, Anyawa, for that. I do want to go to uh, Michelle. I do have a list of uh, her new business items. I, if I can first begin with our SAO uh, in providing an update in relation to the Internet Tower project. I know Councillor Hazel Johnson also brought this up as new business, so that takes care of her new business item. So if I could touch base with, um, I see actually I see Matt Jameson on the line, perhaps maybe he is the individual who can provide us with a, a more thorough update in relation to that project. Maybe I'll touch base with our SEO, Darren, and perhaps sure. uh, Matt, over yeah, to he you. Can, he, can, he can add any more, um, but yeah, I did reach out to Matt. Uh, the, the original, target date for the towers to go live was the middle of July. There was no sort of specific date, um, but I, now they're looking at the end of July uh, for those. Um, I don't know any more beyond that, so I don't know whether, Matt, you want to give us any more detail, but I know it's a target date still, but I know that the towers are up, and so it's just a matter of uh, connections and all that technical stuff that I don't know anything about. So <laughs> maybe you know, if there's anything more you want to add. Yeah, okay, so uh, the revised uh, in-service date is now July 27th. Uh, as you know, the, the towers are up. The biggest challenge we've had is that uh, getting the new service layouts completed with Hydro One, they were down staff due to COVID, and that's been the biggest push on our schedule. Uh, there was a delay on steel fabrication uh, at three sites, but all of that's now been resolved. So we're on track for July 27th. I have been uh, pushing ExploreNet to provide a broad community update on their provision of services and the availability of those services. And so I expect to be able to, I expect that they will be coming out publicly in the next couple of weeks with 
a full breadth of service offerings for the community to pull up the availability of the service. Okay, perfect. Thank you, uh, Darren and Matt, for that update. Are there any questions for Darren and Matt? Yeah, I got one. Sure, go ahead, Carrie. Um, Matt, Matt, with those towers being half the height of the old ones, is there, it must be the technology that's involved in it that is going to make it better than the, better than the ones that are taller? Yeah, that's right, Carrie. <clears throat> it's a 3.5 gigahertz technology. It's got better penetration through, uh, through the tree coverage. But we, remember, we're also adding additional towers as well to pick up the dead spots. So we believe with the additional towers, along with the new technology, those, the, the shorter towers will greatly improve the service coverage to greater than 95% of the community. So uh, we're looking okay. forward. To that. Yep. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Carrie uh, and Matt for that. Are there any further questions or comments in relation to the Internet Tower project? Audrey. Uh, thanks, Matt, for that and all the wonderful work that uh, has been done to get the towers to where we are. I know we've had a lot of uh, community concerns over the years about um, more effective uh, internet. So my question is, uh, where is the 5% that isn't being covered and how will that be addressed maybe with fiber in the future? Thank you. Yeah, there, there is a percentage of homes that we just simply can't cover given, given some of the dense tree coverage we do have and those homes that are in valleys or, you know, um, in, in a valley, for example, with lots of tree coverage will likely not or will struggle with service. So that's the, definitely a problem. Um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, uh, you know, ultimately, fiber is the greatest solution that um, okay, just okay. the timetable associated with that is uh, a little uncertain at this moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Matt. There's just really quickly a question from Facebook coming in for the internet. Why would you not use Skynet from Tesla? Is that something that could be... I think the comment is about Starlink. So is there, is there any, um, can we provide any comment on that piece? I can offer a general comment, Chief. Um, so Starlink is the Elon Musk's internet solution. It does, it does provide satellite internet connectivity and uh, we have looked at it uh, as a potential solution for Six Nations. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, there's not enough satellites on this particular parallel to service all the demand. In fact, the satellites that are there are fully are fully subscribed, and there is an extensive waiting list uh, for access to that service. So, it is an option in the future, and I do expect that uh, that that internet provider will actually be good for the overall competitive nature of the of the market. But right now, it's oversubscribed, and we can't rely on that as a solution for us in the short term. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Matt. For providing that comment. Okay, uh, so is there any further questions or comments in relation to the Internet Tower project? Okay, that solves uh, number one of Michelle's uh, additions as well as Hazel's addition. I'll go to number two of Michelle's addition, which is uh, the reminder of Indian Day School. Yeah, so yesterday I received a complaint or actually a question in regards to, is this law firm doing um, are they legitimate? And so I would just hope that we can remind the community that Deloitte is the firm doing day school. If you have questions in regards to day school, to talk to them. Sure, sure. we can We can definitely uh, do that. We can get that communication out. So if we can make a note on that piece, communication on the line. But I think even to take it a step further as well, we do have the Iroquois Caucus coming up this Friday. Uh, which uh, that was one of the agenda items that were on the previous meetings. I think the other concerns is that, you know, people who have applied, and this is outside of, uh, you know, potential firms trying to, you know, get after, I guess, clients per se, but this is even in addition to, um, say, individuals or applicants who applied for, say, level one, but then now realized or didn't share enough that they actually qualified for a higher level. 
So I know that there's concerns around that piece as well as the deadline of July, 2022 with everything happening with the pandemic and so forth that they uh, were looking to also provide uh, you know, some uh, concern to Deloitte uh, in relation to the deadline and extending that deadline to get applications in given everything that's had has been happening. So I think perhaps maybe Michelle, I could even take this a step further uh, and, and bring it up at the Iroquois caucus meeting uh, on those other concerns that my our office has received as well. Uh, but in the meantime, can definitely get out more communication and a reminder that Deloitte is the is the firm that has been hired to uh, fulfill uh, the duty the duties of uh, getting the funds to individuals. So um, uh, on that note, is there any questions, comments, Helen? Yeah, I've been getting a lot of questions too. But I think what's happening is there's law firms out there telling uh, participants they can get reassessed. Hire us and you can get reassessed, and but you can't get reassessed. Once you submit an application, that's the end of it. Um, I was also told that Indian Day School Review Committee, whoever that may be, um, are looking at the people's, I guess, stories or whatever you want to call them. And they are assessing them at that point if they think the person should be getting a higher level of money, they are raising the money up for that person. Um, you just can't re, re, you know, you can't get your application back and change your mind as to what you had put in initially. And, and it's too bad because I think a lot of people, they just jumped at that 10,000 right away. And, and then they sit back and think about things that happened to them that they should have put down and they never and all that. So it's really unfortunate. And I, what I tell people is those law firms, you know, they're, they're just trying to take your money. Yes, and we can get you reassessed and, and it's not gonna happen. So they're just out there like vultures. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen, for, for your comments. And so again, I, I do still want to bring these uh, concerns and issues forward at the Iroquois Caucus as well, because I know there will be uh, uh, an agenda item or space to do so. Uh, and we'll provide more of a background uh, from that meeting, uh, Michelle. I see Wendy has sure. her hand. I'll, I'll go to Wendy has the floor and then over to Hazel. I was just going to suggest, why don't we invite um, Jeremy back out to do a presentation, you know, in one of the general council or whatever uh, pool community sessions so that he can share and update what's going on and address all of these questions firsthand. 100% agreed. Yes. So we, we just uh, wrote a note on that piece. So with comms as well, we'll further look to Jeremy, Jeremy's availability uh, and, and if and when he could come back into our community. At that, actually, the last time he was down, it was a great session. So yeah, you're, you're right. I think it's time and due for another one. Uh, Hazel. Yeah, I was um, approached uh, with questions regarding the day school where, whereby Six Nations members had applied but were denied because they um, went to school at um, Mississauga. And they started, when they started school, they were within the time frame of um, being eligible. However, when um, Mississaugas took on their own education system well after the kids had started school, and they were not included in the uh, the federal school system. So therefore we're denied on that note. Um, I did send an email off to Jeremy, but I haven't had any response, but I just wanted to ask, what is the consideration there for those um, native students who, who were um, within that time frame to be eligible? However, when they took over that education, I don't exactly know what date that they did that. Um, should there be some consideration for those students to still receive the day school dollars too? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hazel. And we'll look to, I think that's, that's getting uh, a little into specifics. So we'll have to look to Jeremy uh, on those uh, specific items, but nonetheless, I think uh, more, uh, you know, if we can get him down in community and, and, and get uh, that communicated out to community when he will be, uh, in our community, then that's, I think, where we'll give ample opportunity for members to go and directly uh, speak to someone in relation to specifics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hazel. 
Uh, is there any other further questions or comments in relation to the Indian Day School? Okay, seeing or hearing none, I just, uh, I see a comment in the chat or question from Facebook. We were told in a SNEC public meeting uh, that Six Nations was no longer affiliated with the Iroquois Caucus. When did that change and why? So I, I'm not sure as to who told you that or what, but we've always been affiliated with the Iroquois Caucus. What you may be referring to is the independent First Nations. Uh, and so we are not a part of the independent First Nations. We are basically an independent within an independent uh, so that's that change uh, happened, I think, under Chief Montour's uh, um, office during his tenure. So I think that might be uh, what you're referring to, but we've always been a part of the Iroquois Caucus. Okay, that being said, I'll look to Michelle for her third item, dumping, Seneca on third line. Actually, can I talk about sporting events and then dumping because it segues into actually Nathan's update on our meeting today. 100%, sounds good, Michelle. Okay, so it's been great that uh, we've had some big events in our community, started off with the Pride Ride, um, where we've seen a few hundred people, and then I know last week, uh, lacrosse started, and so we're seeing families out and about. So I did have a concern that uh, we are, like, there are groups that want to come forward. Um, so it's nice to see the ECG is saying, yep, yeah, as long as you have your... Um, contact tracing, all of that in order. But I was also reading the ECG minutes and I see we will be moving to green. So I want to make that motion that we move to green and, and actually want to have that discussion in regards to calling off the state of emergency because it's been some time that we've been uh, looking to reopen the community. And I would actually um, really encourage us to start looking at opening the community because when Lori Davis Hill sent us that email last week that we had six overdoses, to me, that's our priority. I mean, we have a lot of priorities, but um, that in itself, um, we, we need to, I don't even know where the drug strategy task force, what, like, do we have an update from them? So um, that's really what I wanted to bring forward, that if we can go green, like Ontario will be doing, well, they're not even going green, they're in third stage come Friday, is it, can we put that, that's my motion to move to green as a Friday. So, uh, so my apologies. Uh, sorry, uh, Michelle, there was there was a, a few items uh, that you had touched on. Um, so I'm just wondering if we can uh, perhaps hold on that piece and just look to further, because uh, we will call a special council meeting, whether it be in line with Friday's uh, Ontario's call on Friday. I'm just wondering if we can hold off on that piece for now so that we can again have all of uh, the ECG meets tomorrow. So I just want to give them an opportunity again to provide and get all their ducks in order to present to full council and transitioning into green. So I'm not saying that it won't happen, just looking to process um, and so that we can follow that, if that's okay. Sure, I just took the notes that says moving to green. That's all. <laughs> so. yeah, no, no problem, I, I, I totally understand and, and, and see where you're coming from. I see Darren has his hand up. Uh, just just to just to confirm when we, we made the last move we did an email uh, poll and that was quite effective um, so ECG is meeting tomorrow so we can make it effective like 1201 a.m I'm sure that they'll concur with the IMT's recommendation but just to go through the process and then we can make it we can do the columns and we can do that and ratify it uh, at our next uh, general finance exactly perfect thank you for that Darren um, Michelle back to you on dumping um, yeah, so can we talk about, the, uh, yeah, I guess the drugs we can talk about um, maybe in closed, I, I don't know. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't I didn't realize you had that one as a new business, I just thought, thought you had well, support. Well, kind of segues <laughs> into both, right, because I think we need to give our community activities to do. It's been a long <laughs> month, so. Um, we need to support, we need to to support one another more. <laughs> Less lateral violence. Back yeah. to you, Michelle, on dumping. Okay, so I had a complaint from a community member in regards to um, there was alleged illegal dumping. I, uh, as we've talked at the Environment Task Force, the process is um, that mo all truckers should have their soil analysis or what they're trucking. Um, so today the police did go and check the items. 
um, and it was actual cinder block. Um, but this speaks to, again, um, the community member is concerned and like, I mean, Councillor Hazel, Helen, went, uh, John, Wendy, everybody's brought forward concerns because things are being um, constructed within neighborhoods and uh, this speaks to zoning. So I wanted to know, is there an update in regards to our last meeting we've discussed um, about zoning? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Michelle. So I will look to uh, our SAO. I know anytime we talk about zoning or talk about any of those pieces, then we're turning us into a municipality, we're turning, getting rules and all this stuff. So, you know, just want to be clear. For, you're yeah. asking for a civil war. Yeah, <laughs> we're not becoming a municipality. We are not tax collectors. We do not pay tax. But I guess it comes down to the point of what kind of standards do we want in this community? Yes. And I think yeah. that's part of what the conversation's about. Over to you, Darren. Yeah, and I'll, I'll start it off. But I, and I would like to invite Nathan. Uh, I know he wanted to do an update on the environment uh, task force, which we had a special uh, strategy session again today. So it's been very quite quite active and a good meeting today. I'll let him speak to it, but. Um, yeah, I think the word that I wanted to maybe share with, with community is um, voluntary compliance. And I think that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the, the vision uh, that, we're, that we want to work towards. But part of that is education, just understanding, you know, the impacts. You know, I said this at the Environment Committee that, you know, it's taken decades for us to get to where we are today. And it's a cumulative effects to the environment. It's not just dumping, it's all kinds of things and to the water, um, the soil, the air. Um, I can, we can go on and on. So we have a very, I, I would say, ambitious plan uh, to, to address it. We've got some resources now in place and more to come to help us with this work. And I think that's the key key here. And part of it is is to inform the community uh, so that everyone is, is, is aware of, you know, if you are bringing in uh, materials that are contaminated or not or inappropriate, then then you know you, you can self check it, check what you're doing, um, and and there's sort of that sort of voluntary compliance regime. If I'll use that word loosely. Um, it's sort of like a self correcting system. I mean, it's a little bit ide idealistic, but if we want to look at a best use plan for the for the territory, that goes hand in hand with that. So you know, what areas do we want to conserve as far as the trees and as far as the watersheds, and what areas are best suited for residential development? Which areas are best suited for commercial development? You know where the services are already located, um, where the plans are to put more services in. So all of that longer-term planning, which which we've we've haven't done in this community enough of. So the first line, the first thing is to do that baseline assessment. This is a big big contextual answer to the question, but I think it's important to, for the community to understand where we're heading. So that is to provide that um, the cumulative effects to how we got to this point and how do we reverse engineer that over time based on not necessarily a zoning, but I would call it a best use plan. Here's the best places uh, for, for housing, commercial development, et cetera. And then we can look at um, other, other checks and balances as we go forward. Uh, we don't wanna get into a thing where, we're, where uh, we have a huge regulatory uh, system. Um, we, we, wanna, we wanna do the work, we wanna do inform ourselves to do the planning and that's the key. And we're finally in a place now where we've got some some real momentum and we're gonna bring, bring this to the community. So maybe I'll pass it quickly to Nathan in terms of our plan and Wendy's has a comment and just in terms of our plan, our, our short-term plan, Nathan, on, on doing, bring awareness uh, on what work has already been done. Just, just really quickly, if I can, just before going over to Nathan, I know he, that's one of his new business items is to provide that verbal update, but just really quickly, if I can touch base with Wendy. Wendy, did you have a question or comment in relation to Darren's comments? Yeah, thanks. I was just going to say that, yes, lots of work to be done, but this has to come from the community. Otherwise, it's going to be interpreted as us imposing, and we can't impose that. I mean, there are all different positions on this in the community, and that's where it has to come from. Agreed. Agreed 100%. Thanks for that, Wendy. So maybe that's a good segue into uh, Nathan's verbal uh, update on the envi his envi uh, environment st strategic session, uh, and so I'll pass it over to Nathan to maybe because I know this is this is all this is how the environment was really uh, started the, the 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 task force or, or committee rather is because of all of the complaints coming in par primarily around illegal dumping. Over to you, Nathan. 
No, thanks, Chief, and and thanks for the three segues. I got less to less to update on, um, but uh, Wendy, to your point, exactly. Um, we we have to we know and we recognize that we have to take this out to the community, and that's exactly what the discussion was today, in terms of uh, when we we um, talked about strategy. Um, but I just want to kind of walk back a little bit and and take a minute or two to kind of. Um, give that update from, from the last time we talked to council and it was about the terms of reference. And, uh, you know, at that time, there's a lot of discussion about, um, you know, formulating a, a department and, and a committee for the environment. Um, but I think our thinking has progressed and, and we've seen that we need um, also to, to support capacity building uh, within the organization. And, and that's, uh, why I think we've taken and gone back to the task force approach. Um, today was uh, really enlightening because we did have um, our subject matter experts on, on the line and we had our departments on the line that uh, public works was there, health was there, um, lands and membership were there, um, as well as um, our technicians and subject matter experts as it relates to environment. And we really strategically um, took a look at finding um, uh, I guess over the time we've we've looked at the issues and the challenges and, and taken kind of a legal dumping is that, um, for lack of a better term, operational case study, uh, because it's come up a number of times and, you know, utilizing the process of, you know, um, identifying and, and uh, Six Nations Police going out there and doing the stops and identifying what's in there. Um, also um, looked at and, and are, are looking at um, the cost benefit and the cost of doing soil testing, water testing um, as, as kind of that second piece in that process, um, just so that we have that information and that, that, that piece. And then uh, after that, it's uh, as Darren's kind of outlined that best use plan. Um, going forward. So we have talked uh, at length about what's um, kind of thinking outside the box for these processes and, and utilizing the concerns and, and the challenges that we faced over the years as kind of that gaps analysis. So today what we talked about as a task force and again having the departments was, was valuable is <clears throat> doing that kind of information dump and, and doing an environmental scan. Um, from the standpoint of looking at it, um, and, and Rod Whitlow is an amazing, an amazing resource, um, just the wealth of knowledge, and, and he's a library, uh, environmental library amongst, uh, amongst themselves, and, and having him kind of art walk us through and saying, we should look at this, we should look at uh, these baseline documents, and getting that baseline data was, was where we talked about today. And what we're going to use that um, for is to come up with an environmental scan presentation to take back out to the community and back to Wendy's point. From there, we have, you know, what we've done in the past, what's worked and what hasn't. Take that back out to the community to get further direction on, on a lot of those pieces. Um, and and, and um, also, um, we talked about, again, today, including um, the HCCC in, in our discussions, because we know they've, they've done a number of uh, work and have made statements of this in the past. So uh, it's, it's, again, learning from the past to inform the future. Um, and that's what we want to be able to put down in terms of uh, the presentation and doing the environmental scan report, taking that back out to the community, getting their feedback, identifying the priorities, uh, and really the community will develop the action plan for us going forward. So I just wanted to, uh, I know it's been quite some time since we've done an update. I just wanted to give a verbal update on, on our, um, our progression today. And again, uh, we committed to meeting every two weeks uh, until we get that presentation done and out to the community uh, for further feedback. So that's the update. I don't know if I missed anything, Michelle, Sherry Lynn. Okay, great. I think you, you did a, a great job, Nathan, uh, on presenting that update and, and really look forward to next steps here. You know, it's really, um, this, is a, this is the exciting work uh, that, that, that we need to be focused on. Like, you know, I know that this council has put the environment as a priority and it's really nice to see that we're putting in processes and, and things in place and listening to members and what, you know, developing and what that looks like, you know, collaboratively. Um, I know there's there's one one question from Facebook, and I know you've already mentioned this within your statement uh, or your verbal update. 
uh, in relation to the HGC putting out a statement regarding illegal dumping years ago, but the further issue was the enforcement piece. So recognizing that this leads into another bigger uh, piece, because this is something that community, uh, to Wendy's earlier comment, you know, it needs to come from community. Um, and I think that's where, again, we need to be very, uh, very, again, strategic and cautious as we move forward. But we can definitely put out a statement if that's the, you know, the willingness of this council. Uh, and we, we, we would want nothing more than to continue working with the HCC. I know we've been putting out multiple uh, letters and, and so forth. Uh, and so, you know, we're doing everything we can to continue to, to work together as a, as a community. Um, but again, Nathan, just wanted to say nyawa to, to you and your committee. Uh, for doing this important work and, and looking forward to uh, what we come up with in our next steps. Are there any further questions or comments for Nathan? Okay, that being said, uh, Nate, I, Nate, I will go into your second item, which was, I believe, a community-wide update in relation to almost like the AGM. I'm not sure if you had, a, if that was just a question or yeah, I think I, I've been hearing um, from community members the need uh, to, uh, uh, I guess, shift our thinking now away from the pandemic into now having these community meetings where they're more broadly, um, more public. Um, and, and definitely, I know, like environment, we're getting ready um, to, to have a presentation and have some material there for community consumption. Uh, and I know we have a number of initiatives that, uh, you know, uh, the community can probably benefit from in terms of that that wider update as it relates to what we're up to. Um, and because I know like we do the, uh, and, and we have opened up these Zooms to communities, um, but at the same time, um, uh, it, it, there's no congruency in terms of our overall strategy and our approach, right? So we have a number of hot topic uh, items that, that need to come out, uh, you know, the, the strategy to bring our children home um, constantly, the environment, um, you know, lifelong learning is a, a hot topic as well going forward. We need to, and, and I've heard from Audrey, we still need to do the engagement there. Um, so I'm just wondering um, now if we can start maybe um, highlight this for the strategy session um, and, and look to developing uh, a wider community forum where we can have community members come in, COVID uh, restrictions and per precautions obviously in place um, to, um, to do that. So that's just, um, I'm just wondering, I think uh, the strategy session will give us a good time to plan that out, get a date and, and execute. Yeah, so, so and Nathan, yeah, thank you for bringing this forward. Actually, you, you touched on, an, on a number of important items uh, the first is, you know, as we are, are planning and getting ready to prepare for our follow-up retreat, uh, that's to really to now get into, I know we've been trying and planning to do this for some time, uh, and then three months in, a uh, worldwide pandemic hit. I know, obviously, we can't use that as an excuse now because, there, you know, we are hopefully seeing light at the end of the tunnel with this pandemic, but again, obviously, have to still be cautious with the, the variants and so forth. You know, really keeping our guard up and not letting it entirely down. Um, but that being said, is we are approaching our midterm. Um, and what we are envisioning as, as the chief's office and the political team is that when we do then now come up with, you know, our next follow-up retreat, which will then have all of our, our, really our overall strategy in terms of where we're heading for the next two years as this council. Um, and that's, I think, something that's going to be very important to share with, with community uh, especially in relation to communications. Uh, I know, you know, we've, we've redone the website <laughs> that has been long, long overdue. We've changed minimal things like, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the newsletter, as well as the Zooms, actually, uh, even to answer the question from Facebook is when will the public be allowed to attend council again? You know, we're working on those very pieces now. Uh, so hopefully, again, as we shift into green and hopefully maintain in green, uh, that we can open up our council building back open for public and to have our meetings back in person. So our goal date hopefully is by end of August, beginning of September to do that once we have all of our buildings fully cleaned uh, and set up and so forth. Um, so those items will be also forthcoming. But I, again, to your point, Nathan, is you know when we go and do our follow-up retreat to some of these big ticketed items, last time I counted there was 32 ongoing files in this community. And that was by no way of prioritization. That's 32 files across the board that this community and council has been working with. 
Um, and again, to what status each of those files are, that's exactly what the update that we want to share in providing the strategic update to community. So basically, you know, uh, we're not set on the on what we're calling it, but it is basically like a midterm, a midterm strategy to community uh, to give community that, you know, that outlook as to where we're heading. So there's not no surprises in the next two years. You know, this is exactly where we're going with environment. Here's the engagement sessions. Here's the status. Here's where we are in education. Here's the, uh, the, the status of that piece. Here's where we are, we are with our, our pandemic response. Here's, you know, there's a number, and I, I refer to them as files, just again, this from my own terminology, but that's exactly bringing all those files because there's so much important work. And that's where, again, you know, obviously even coming out of a, a worldwide pandemic, we need, to, we need to support each other even more so now moving forward while this important work continues. And I think that's exactly where, you know, I, I want to be shifted and focus in on this important work, like recovering our children and, and so forth. But to your point, point, Nathan, even within finances, our financial position, all of those pieces is going to be key components to our midterm document that we want to give to full community. So that is forthcoming and that, that was actually uh, going to our, our follow-up retreat is going to, to answer a lot of these questions and really be uh, a part of uh, the pieces to really bring the puzzle, solve the puzzle, and then present it. Not sure if there's any questions or comments on that. Sounds great, Chief. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for bringing that forward. Again, there our teams are working tirelessly, uh, and I have to even you know commend our admin team. I know Shirley's on the line, Tammy, all of the, our admin staff. These individuals are are the backbone to our organization, and I really just want to give them a quick shout out because I know uh, I see the work they do, and it's tireless for this community and on behalf of this community. So. Just really want to say thank you to all of our admin staff that continue to help this council moving forward. Uh, that being said, council, that's all I have for the uh, for the new business uh, and for our council agenda of July 13th. That being said, can I then now move to a motion to adjourn? Moved by Audrey, second by Wendy. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motions carried. Thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, and looking forward to our next time on Facebook. Take care.